Okay, welcome to Word Without Walls. Welcome to the Wednesday night sunlight service. Again, we're flexible. We try to meet everybody's needs. Uh, this is the mirror part three. We're continuing to look in the mirror to see Jesus, to see ourselves, to understand that as he is, so are we in this world. So it's very important to understand as he is so that, you know, so that we can understand how we are in this world. And tonight, we're going to start on uh, three of the things that Jesus identified himself as, the way, the truth, and the life. Tonight, we're going to start on the way. And again, you know, it's my heart for this series to, to really just kind of slow down and take things kind of piece by piece. Last week, we really, really dug into the transfiguration because that was our key scripture in, uh, I think it was in 2 Corinthians, that, that tells us that when we look in the mirror or, or the word, we are transformed or changed or transfigured into that same image. So again, it's, it, it, it's not about a change that we need to make, but rather about seeing the change that occurred on the cross. See, our, our, our epic destiny, our eternal purpose in Christ, was to be conformed into the image of Jesus. And that's not in our future, that's in our past. That's what the cross was, that's what happened. So I don't need to conform into the image of Jesus. I am conformed into the image of Jesus. Now what I need to do is I need to find out what that image is. And the way that I find out what the image of Jesus is, is by looking at Him. And the way that I look at Him, because He's inside me, is I look in the mirror. So that's what we're continuing to do in this, this series called The Mirror. And uh, I want to read Psalm 86, verse 11, but my first passage of Scripture tonight is going to be in John chapter 14. So if you want to turn to John, I can read Psalm 86, 11. And in the King James it says, Teach me thy way, O Lord, I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. And again, this fear that we're talking about, it's not being afraid of a God who's going to get you. It's, it's a reverence or an awe. So when my heart is united, then I will really understand his name. Then I will really identify with his name. When my heart is united with God's heart, when I understand that God's heart is beating with love in my chest, then I will also be united with his name or his nature or his character. And then what's in me then comes out of me. But again, walking in the truth comes from him teaching us his way, from him revealing himself to us so that we understand I'm not, I'm not trying to walk it out and, and this is an important distinction. This is really more than anything what this sermon tonight is about. Is Jesus doesn't show us the way and then we walk it out. That's not it at all. Jesus is the way and we walk in the way because he walks in us. So it's not Jesus just, you know, just being the patterned son and just saying, you know, do this, you know, and, and then you, you can be like me. That was the lie that was told to Adam and Eve way back in the garden that they had to do something in order to be like God. That's not Jesus. Jesus does not expect us to walk it out in our flesh or, or, or in our human effort. He, instead, he expects us to walk in it, again, because he's walking in us. So it says, I will walk in thy truth. And that's important because we're going to see that again later. So, John chapter 14, and I'm going to start with verse 1 and read down through about verse 12. In the King James, it reads like this. Jesus is speaking, and he says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Which is so important right off the bat. It's not what you do, it's what you believe. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So don't let your heart be troubled, but instead let your heart rest in him. Understand that your heart has been circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and now it's not your heart anymore, it's His heart. And really, that unlocks a whole lot of things, because when I understand that it's God's heart in my chest, then I can follow my heart wherever it goes. Then I can trust my heart. Then if I have a desire in my heart, I know where it comes from. It comes from the Lord. It's the power of God that works in me both to will and to do of His good pleasure. So, so again, if it comes from the heart and we understand that the only thing that really comes from the heart is love, then I can absolutely trust my heart. So he says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. 
and this, this, this verse has been, you know, really, really, really misunderstood. Jesus was not saying, I'm going to heaven to make you a mansion. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions, and that word, it means abode or dwelling place, which remember we did a whole series about the dwelling place. Jesus is the dwelling place. The love of the Father is the dwelling place. When he said, I go to prepare a place for you, he was speaking about the cross. The cross is where he made us into a house for him to live in. It's not about him making us a house somewhere for us to live in, but instead about him taking up abode in, in us. We, we really, we are all the mansions in the Father's house. We live in the kingdom, but at the same time we are the kingdom because the king lives in us. Because of the cross. Because he went and prepared a place for us. Which again goes back to the verse above when he said, Let not your hearts be troubled. He said, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to give you my heart. I'm preparing a place for you. And it's, it, it, it's not some dimension called heaven, but it's the person of Jesus who is heaven. And again, it's not necessarily for us to live in, except that you know we live in heaven because heaven lives in us. It's not a, a, a physical place, but, but a spiritual place. So he, he says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And again, where is he? He's in heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father on the throne. So that's what the cross accomplished. That's where we are right now. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He brought us back. He received us unto himself through the cross, at the cross, for the cross. Verse 4 says, And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. And then Thomas, you know, good old Thomas, my namesake, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? So Thomas, you know, Thomas says, Okay, God, okay, Jesus, that sounds great, but I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know where you want me to go. I don't know what you want me to go. I don't know how to get there. And Jesus, in verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So again, what was Jesus talking about? He wasn't talking about a literal heaven. When he said, I go to prepare a place for you, he, when he was talking about the cross, he was talking about coming unto the Father. He was talking about opening up a relationship for us to know God as our Father. Not as an angry taskmaster, not as a distant God, not as someone who you have to please through your efforts, but as a Father. He said, no man cometh to the Father but by me. And he said, this is how you do it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that word way, it's number 3598 in Strong's Creek Concordance, and it means road. By implication, a progress, mode, or means. So he was saying, I am the road to the Father. I am the progression to the Father. I am the mode or the means to the Father. You can't get there by yourself. You can build a tower of Babel and try to reach the heavens, but that's not what God wants for you. That's not. He never wants you to, to ascend up to Him through your human effort. What He wants you to do, He, he, he wants you to understand that it was Jesus' effort on the cross, the finished work, it was Jesus descending down to us. It was not us ascending up to God. He said, the way to the Father is through me. I'm going to come and I'm going to become what you are. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. He took us from where we were at rather than expecting us to get anywhere on our own. Because we can't get anywhere on our own. And again, that's, that's really kind of the emphasis of this message is... It's not about what we do, it's about what He did. It's not about walking something out. It's not about, you know, taking, okay, I'm saved and now I have to act a certain way. But instead it's about, I'm saved, now someone in me is acting how He wants to act. I don't try to be Jesus. Nobody can be Jesus except Jesus. So then that behooves us to understand that we are Jesus, and because of who we are, then we can do all of the things that God has purposed for us to do which is what Jesus is about to go on to say in just a minute. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And that's our key verse for the next, at least the next three weeks. He says in verse 7, If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. One of Jesus' most uh, important purposes for coming to the earth in human flesh 
was to show us who God really is. To show us the Father. To knock over our religious apple cart and say, guys, what you think about God is wrong. This is what God is really like. This is how God really acts in a situation. This is what it means for uh, Emmanuel, God with us. This is what it means for the Word, which is love, to be made flesh. This is what this is who God really is. And in verse 8, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. So Jesus, you know, Jesus says, He says, If you had known me, you would have known my Father. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. And then Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and it will be good enough for us. And then in verse 9, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? He's like, this. You're, you're still missing it. I'm standing right in front of you, and I'm telling you exactly what's going on, and you're still missing it. He says, if you want to see the Father, look at me. He says, if you want to know anything about God, the answer is Jesus. So again, you know, that's the whole purpose of, of, of this, of, of at the very least, of this sermon series, is if we want to find out about ourselves, we have to understand that we're dead and our lives are hidden in Christ. So if I, want to know, if I want to know about me, I find that answer, I find my life in Him. So when I see Him, I see the Father, I enter into that relationship because again, he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the road. He, he is the progress or the motor, the means that, that I get to the Father. So it's through him that I understand who, who God really is. It's in him that I understand who I really am. So verse 10 says, Believeth thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the work. So even Jesus was saying, listen, this isn't me. I'm not doing this on my own. It's the Father in me that's doing it. In the same way, you know, it, it, it's exactly the same way that Paul said, you know, I am crucified with Christ, yet I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And this life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. He says, I died, so it's not me living anymore, it's Jesus living in me. Jesus said, this isn't me, this is the Father in me. It's that progression of what's inside of you is what's true about you. It's not the outside, it's not the flesh, it's not the mistakes, it's not, you know, it, 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 it's not the, uh, again, Paul said to know no man after the flesh. It's not what you, you necessarily see with your natural eyes that's true, it's the inner man, the hidden man of the heart. It's the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. Which again is what Jesus said when he said, I go to prepare a place for you. You know, again, it wasn't him building us somewhere to live as much as it was him building us into somewhere for him to live. He said, I'm going to take up a, a abode in you. I'm going to live in you. And then you don't have to worry about living because I'm just going to be living in and through you. The same way that the Father did for him. He said, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. So again, you know, it, 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 it's, like, it's like when we become Christians, the, the thought process is, I want to be like Jesus. But the truth is, I couldn't be any more like Jesus than I already am, because he lives in me. All the things he's done, and greater things... Than he did in his physical body. I'm going to do because it's still him doing it in me. He went to the Father and he sent us his spirit. So, so you know, again, instead of one man named Jesus, now we are all that, that new man. Now we are all part of that body of Christ. Now we are all filled with that spirit. He poured out his spirit on all flesh, which I've always taken to mean on all of us and to mean on all human effort. Which again is the big key here is I'm not walking this out in my own strength. I'm not trying to be Jesus. I'm not trying to be I'm not trying to be anything. I'm just simply resting in him and knowing that he is in me and what's in me comes out of me naturally. What you believe about yourself really truly does define you because what you believe is what you're going to do. If you believe you're a quote unquote sinner, that's how you're gonna act. But instead, if you let your heart not be troubled. If you say, I believe in God, okay, then I believe in Jesus, which, which again is God in the flesh, love in a body, love in our body. If you say, okay, if I believe in Jesus, if I believe that there's love in me, that's what's going to come out of me. 
So it's all it's always from the inside out, and it's never from the outside in. The old covenant was all about external rules that tried to modify our behavior and get us to act a certain way. But even if you're acting like Jesus, it's still just an act. But if it comes from the inside, if it comes from your heart, then, you know, again, I, I quoted, I believe it's from uh, Proverbs, I quoted it earlier, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What you truly believe about yourself is what you're going to do. Everything flows from what you believe. So, John 14 in the Message Bible, it reads like this, starting with verse 1. And the heading on this one is, is the road, which, which is really kind of what we're talking about. That's what the word way means. It means road. And we're going to look at that, you know, again in a minute. So, John 14, verse 1 in the Message Bible reads, Don't let this throw you. You trust God, don't you? Trust me. There is plenty of room for you in my Father's home. If that weren't so... What I have told you, that I'm on my way to get a room ready for you? And if I'm on my way to get your room ready, I'll come back and get you so you can live where I live. And you already know the road I'm taking. Thomas said, Master, we have no idea where you're going. How do you expect us to know the road? And again, where was he going? To the cross. Where was he going? To the Father. So, so he says, Jesus said, I am the road, also the truth, also the life. No one gets to the Father apart from me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him. You've even seen him. Philip said, Master, show us the Father, then we'll be content. You've been with me all this time, Philip, and you still don't understand? To see me is to see the Father. So how can you ask, where is the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you aren't mere words. I don't just make them up on my own. The Father who resides in me crafts each word into a divine act. And again, that's the thing about the Word of God. When God speaks, things happen. The first time God is ever recorded as speaking, way back in Genesis, He said, let there be light, and there was light. God's Word does not fall void. God's Word accomplishes the task that it sets out to accomplish. It does what it sets out to do. Because again, how, you know, how could it not? You know, let, you, know, you know the verse, let every man, let God be true and every man be a liar. That's not saying, you know, make sure that God is true. What it's saying is God is true. And, and, and again, that's how Jesus identified himself as the truth. So, so it's not that everything that God says has to be true. It's that everything God says is true, period. If God said, you know, the, the sky is green, the sky would be green. That's the power, that's the, the, the divine act that the Father who resides in us crafts each word into. When He gives you a word and you speak that word, it's life-changing. Because, because, again, I believe the, the only, the one word, capital W, the word of God, is love, is Jesus. And when you speak love in His situation, that's what that situation needs. And it may not always look the same, because, you know, love comes in many forms. I preached this before. I believe the one singular fruit of the Spirit is love. And then all those other qualifications are different, just different flavors of that one fruit. Because you don't always need, you know, you, you know every situation may need a different tool. But it's all love. So whatever the situation needs, you know, that, that's what it needs. It needs love. It, and, and, and the focus here is that it's not me, but, but it's the one in me who, I love the way he puts this, the Father who resides in me crafts each word into a divine act. He goes on and says, Believe me, I am in my Father, and my Father is in me. If you can't believe that, believe what you see, these works. The person who trusts me will not only do what I am doing, but even greater things, because I, on my way to the Father, and giving you the same work to do that I've been doing. Which again, uh, I believe it's Paul picks up in, in the New Covenant, where he speaks of Jesus had the ministry of reconciliation, and we have that same ministry. The whole point of this whole thing is to bring people together, not to, put pe not to pull people apart. The whole point of this is to walk in the way, instead of trying to walk out what you think needs to be done. So, speaking of the road... You know, again, the, the word way, it means road. That took me to Isaiah chapter 35, verse 8. 
which says in the King James, Isaiah 35, 8 reads, And an highway shall, there be, shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those. The wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. So again, this, this way, this highway of holiness, this street called straight, it is Jesus. It's not where Jesus walked, so to speak, it's who Jesus was. And that's why it says, the unclean shall not pass over it, because again, it, you know, it's like, it's like the white stone in Revelation that has a new name written on it that nobody knows until they receive it. The, this way, it's, it's not, you know, it doesn't mean anything to anybody uh, until you understand that, that you're on it, that you're in it. You know, it's not, it, it, it's like the promised land is not for Adam, it's for Jesus, because the promised land is Jesus. So, so what I'm saying is, we think, you know, in, in, in our, you know, religious mindset, we think, okay, I'm a Christian, I'm supposed to act this way, and so are you. But what we have to understand is that this highway is internal, it's inside of us. We can't put anybody else out there. We can't put quote-unquote, unclean people on that. We can't expect other people to live up to a standard that, that really we can't even live up to. You know, I just had a big rant series about about the the term righteous still, where Revelation says, you know, let, let him who is filthy be filthy still. Let him who, who is righteous be righteous still. He's saying, who you believe you are, that's who you're going to be. But you can't change that for somebody else. You can't force somebody else to be anybody other than who they believe. Nobody understands the, the, the name written on the white stone until they received it. And again, I believe that name is Jesus. I don't think you can force Jesus down anybody's throat, but I think if Jesus, just like he did with, with Saul of Tarsus, if Jesus knocks you off your donkey and if he reveals himself to you, then that's a different thing. Then that's a different story. So, so, so what I want to say is, we really, we have to cut people some slack. We have to love people so that they can see the way, rather than trying to stick them on it and say, you better stay on this way. Because again, what we have to understand is, is the way, Jesus, it's not necessarily as much something that we're on as someone that we're in, because he's in us. And again, that's the difference between walking out what we think we're supposed to do and simply walking in the way. And we're going to get back to that in a minute. But first, I want to read uh, Proverbs fourteen twelve, and this is kind of a this is kind of a contrast. Proverbs fourteen twelve says, "There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death." And here's what I want to say about this: is is we think that means there's a good way to do things and a bad way to do things. We think there's a way that seems right, but it's really the wrong way. But, but here's the deal. The way which seems right to a man is human effort. We think with our natural minds that if there's a problem, we need to fix it. We think with our carnal minds that I have to do something. That's the way that seems right to a man. That's the lie that Adam and Eve swallowed, again, back in the garden, when the serpent said, if you eat of this fruit, then you'll be like God. That clicked in their brain and they said, oh, that seems so right, that fits, that's perfect. Of course I have to do something in order to be like God. Of course he's way up here and I'm way down here. That makes perfect sense that he's holy and I'm dirty. That makes sense to the, per to, to, to the carnal mind. That way seems right, but the ends thereof are the ways of death, which is picked up in James chapter 1, verse 15. When James writes, he says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now if you really look at that uh, passage in Genesis with the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it says that, that Eve looked at the tree and, and, and she, would, she desired it. She found it desirable. She lusted after it. And that was the problem. She wanted something that she didn't think she had. Which again, you know, Eve representing the soul or the mind, will, and emotions. That's how we get into trouble is when we want something that we think we don't have. Especially when what we want is the love of the Father. Especially when we think what we don't have is the love of the Father. That gets us into so much trouble because if you think you're not loved, you're going to look for love in all the wrong places. You're going to do whatever you think you need to do in order to get that love. 
And that's what it says here. When lust, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And again, I, I, you know, I don't define sin as, as quote-unquote, doing something bad. To me, sin is unbelief. So, so you want the love of the Father, which comes from that sin or unbelief that you don't believe He loves you. And then, when that is finished, it brings forth death. Which is what God told Adam. He said, if you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. He didn't say, if you eat from this tree, I'm going to get mad and punish you. But somehow, that's what man heard him say. And that's why Adam and Eve hid themselves, you know, they hid from the presence of God after their sin, after their unbelief had brought forth spiritual death or, or brought forth in their minds separation from the Father. They literally walked and talked with God in the cool of the evening until they, again, wanted a different way to do it, wanted something that made sense to them. There was a way that seemed right to them, and the end of that way was death. And after they died again, you know, spiritually died, in their minds died, then, after they were enemies in their minds because of their wicked deeds, then they had to hide from God. And then God said, you know, he said, why are you hiding? And Adam said, you know, we hid because we were naked. And God said, who told you you were naked? He said, I didn't care yesterday that you were naked. Why would I care today? Nothing on God's part had changed, but everything on man's part had changed because he was not, he, he, he was trying to go on, on a way instead of the way. There were two trees spoken of in that book in Genesis, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is a way that seemed right, and the tree of life, which is the way. And, and again, you know, Adam and Eve swallowed the lie, they, they sinned, they didn't believe, they, they tried to get it through human effort, they tried to walk this thing out, they tried to say, if I can find out enough about good and evil, I can stop doing evil and I can do good, and then I'll be like God, and then God will accept me, and then God will love me. But that's not the way that it was at all. God never told them that. God said, I love you. I created you. I'm your father. What else could I do but love you? I am love. And if they had believed that instead of believing the lie, then, then you know, then I don't, obviously things would be different. But, but you know, again, they couldn't believe that because without the Holy Spirit, God's love, it, it, it just doesn't make sense. God's love is too big to understand without a love receptor. It's impossible for somebody to believe everything I've done in my life, all the screw-ups I've done, all the bad things I've done, all the bad thoughts I've done, it's impossible to believe that God loves you without the Holy Spirit. It just doesn't make sense. And again, that's why Jesus came. He came to show us the Father. He came to show us what love really means. He laid his life down for us on the cross to show us the greatest expression of love. And he did it while we were sinners. He did it while we were unbelievers. He came and got us when we weren't even looking for Him. So again, that's what we see is that, that death comes from that sin, from that unbelief. It comes from that way that seems right, but it leads unto death. It doesn't, it, 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 again, it doesn't come from the highway of holiness. It doesn't come from Jesus. But we can't get onto that road until we understand that that road got into us. So, sticking in Isaiah... Flip backwards to Isaiah chapter 30. And I like this in the... I'm actually going to read it in the Message Bible first. Isaiah chapter 30, I'm going to start with verse 15. And the heading for the, uh, the passage in the Message Bible says, God takes the time to do everything right. And this is important because first we have to understand that it's God who's doing it. We have to understand that it's Jesus who did the work and finished the work. Jesus did it all so we could get it all. And he did it right because, again, because God takes the time to do everything right. God's not in a hurry. God's not worried about how long this progression takes you. God's not worried about where you are on this highway of holiness. What's important is that you begin to know who you are, and then once you begin to know who you are, then everything else just flows from that identity. So Isaiah chapter 30, starting with verse 15, in the Message Bible it reads, God the Master, the Holy of Israel, has solemn counsel. Your salvation requires you to turn back to me and stop your silly efforts to save yourselves. Think about that. What he requires from you is to believe that salvation comes from him. 
Stop your silly efforts to save yourself. Stop trying to walk this thing out. Stop trying to say, if I'm holy, then I should be doing this. Stop that. That's silly. Just understand that it says, he says, your strength will come from settling down in complete dependence on me. The biggest difference between just about every other religion out there and Jesus is that every other religion out there requires you to serve a God, requires you to do things for your God. And Jesus came and he said, I'm not here to be ministered to. I'm here to minister to you. He said, You're, I'm not here to make you serve me. I'm here to serve you. I'm not here for you to wash my feet. I'm here to wash your feet. I'm not here for you to, uh, to you know, bow down to me and, and, and all these different things that we think we're supposed to do. I'm here to show you that what this thing is all about is about living with each other, loving one another. It's not so much about, oh God, you're so holy, I have to worship you. And, and I'm not saying we don't worship God, but I'm saying to truly worship Him in spirit and in truth, we have to understand that it's, that it's Jesus inside of us who does the worshiping. It's all about Him and what He's doing, and it's never about us and what we're doing. He says again, he says, Your salvation requires you to turn back to me and stop your silly efforts to save yourselves. Your strength will come from settling down in complete dependence on me, which is rest, just resting in the finished work, just saying, I don't have to do anything because he did everything and he's still doing everything in me. If God requires something from you, God will do it in you and through you. He says, the very thing you've been unwilling to do, you've said, nothing doing, we'll rush off on horseback. You'll rush off all right, just not far enough. You've said, we'll ride off on fast horses. Do you think your pursuers ride old nags? Think again. A thousand of you will scatter before one attacker. Before a mere five, you'll all run off. There will be nothing left of you. A flagpole on a hill with no flag. A signpost on a road with the sign torn off. And again, this just speaks to human effort. Because horses in the Bible, they always represent human effort. They always represent what man can do for himself by himself. And God says, here's what you can do for yourself. Nothing. Here's what you can do by yourself. Nothing. You'll end up just wearing yourself out. You know, I learned a long time ago that when you bang your head against the wall, what you get is a headache. So instead of trying to do this in our own human efforts, we need to just stop trying and start resting. You know, again, with the understanding that, you know, rest is not inactivity. If I'm resting, it doesn't mean I'm not doing anything. What well, rest means is I'm letting Jesus do whatever he wants in me. Rest is not inactivity, it's Holy Spirit directed activity. And I think there's a difference between direction and between, you know, uh, 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 being a servant, as it were. Because the Bible tells us that those who are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. So there's this prompting inside of us, which, which again I was trying to say, if it comes from your heart, go for it. If it comes from your heart, do it. Because God is your heart. The Holy Spirit is your heart. If it's coming from inside, if it's coming from love and compassion, then, then that's Him in you. And just, you know, again, just be sensitive to that. Just, just go with that. Just walk in that. Which we're going to see again uh, when I read this in the King James Version. He says, so after he tells what's going to happen with human effort, we get down to verse 18, and it says, But God's not finished. He's waiting around to be gracious to you. He's gathering strength to show mercy to you. God takes the time to do everything right. Everything. Those who wait around for Him are the lucky ones. So, so again, basically He's saying, you know, if you want to try it, go ahead and try it. But when you're done trying it, then God will be ready for you. When you come to yourself, then you can come back to Daddy's house. When you understand that, that, you know, his strength is made perfect in our weakness, then then we'll stop trying to be so strong. And I think that's important when we're talking about love because because it, in many ways, love can make you vulnerable. You know, sometimes it's hard to put your heart out there, but when you understand that, that it's his heart, and that even if it gets bruised a little bit, it will not be broken, then you can have that assurance, again, that love never fails. Because if God is love, in order for love to fail, God would have to fail. And how can that happen? It can't, especially considering that he already finished the work. 
There's nothing left for him to fail about. Your salvation is secure in him if you stop all your silly trying to do it yourself. It says, oh yes, people of Zion, citizens of Jerusalem, your time of tears is over. Cry for help and you'll find it's grace and more grace. Which again is picked up in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews when it talks about now because of Jesus, because of the high priest, because of the cross and the finished work, now we can come boldly to the throne of grace to find grace to help in a time of trouble. Now we can just tap into the source and we have everything that we need bubbling up from inside us and just flowing out naturally. So he says, the moment he hears, he'll answer. Just as the master kept you alive during the hard times, he'll keep your teacher alive and present among you. Your teacher will be right there, local and on the job, urging you on whenever you wander left or right. This is the right road. Walk down this road. And again, who's the teacher? The Holy Spirit. Who's the comforter? The Holy Spirit. Who leads and guides us into all truth? The Holy Spirit. So, so really, when we need something, where do we look? We look inside. We look in our hearts and we find Him there, so we find the answer there. He says, you'll scrap your expensive and fashionable God images. Man, I wish we could scrap some of our images about God and just look at Jesus. And just see the Father in the context of the Son. And just stop thinking about, you know, a, a, you know, an angry God who's out to get you if you mess up. That's not a God of love. That's not a Heavenly Father. You know, again, I, I, I've only been a father for a couple of years, but I can tell you, I do not look at my son and, and, and just wait for him to mess up so I can get him. I do everything I can to help him, to, to take care of him, to guide him and protect him. I'm on his side, and I tell him that all the time. And, and, and you know, one of the coolest things ever, he told me the other day, I say this all the time, but he said it to me. He said, don't worry, Daddy, I got your back. And I said, I know, son, I've got your back too. And that's how, we, that's how we need to see God. He's got our back. He's on our side. And he's not only just got our back, he lives in us. So when it's him working in and through us, then we know that everything will be okay. That's the rock that we stand on. He says, uh, you'll scrap your expensive and fashionable God images. You'll throw them in the trash as so much garbage, saying good riddance. And again, to me, that's that's the big that's a big part of the whole point. Is just really getting to see God as He truly is, so we can see ourselves as we truly are, so we can be ourselves as we truly are. So Isaiah 30, starting with verse 15 in the King James, I'm gonna go through it fast because I really just want to hit one verse on it. It says for thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall, your, shall be your strength. But ye would not. So again, he's saying it doesn't come from you, it comes from me. It doesn't come from human effort, it comes from rest. It doesn't come from what you can do, it comes from what I've done. But you don't get it. He says, but ye said no, for we will flee upon horses. Therefore shall ye flee, and we will ride upon the swift. Therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one. At the rebuke of five shall ye flee. Till ye be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain, and as an ensign on a hill. And therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait on him. For the people shall dwell in Zion and Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. For he will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more. But thine eyes shall see thy teachers. So again, he, you know, he's saying, there's still things that are going to happen, but you've got what you need inside of you. He said, you may have tribulation in this world, but be of good cheer. For greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world. He says, when the Holy Spirit wildfire inside is inside of you, then the fire in you is always hotter than the fire that you're in. 
then you don't have to worry so much about circumstances and you can instead, you can again, you can rely on the source of your righteousness, peace, and joy. You can rely on the kingdom that is in the Holy Ghost to understand that, again, we're not just in the kingdom, but we are the kingdom. To again understand that that it's not it's not just the king of kings ruling over us, but ruling through us. We are kings and priests. And we have the you know dominion over this earth. Again, as he is, so are we in this world. We don't have to let uh, circumstances dictate to us because we have the teacher, the comforter, the Holy Spirit inside of us, leading us, guiding us, directing us, revealing him to us, and again you know revealing us to ourselves in him. He says, and this is where I really wanted to get, verse 21 of Isaiah 30. He says, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand or when ye turn to the left. So again, it's not about walking out what Jesus has done for us. It's not about saying, Okay, Jesus saved me, now I better do the rest of it on my own human effort. It's about someone behind us, which, which, again, doesn't speak to me of, of, of leading us or dragging us, but instead of propping us up and holding us up and saying, here's the way, walk in it. Of saying, here's Jesus, and he's in you, and you're in him, and everything flows from that identity. Everything flows from, again, what, uh, what Psalms 86 verse 11 said, that unity of heart gives us the, the, that fear of his name or that awe or that reverence of his name. So we understand that because of his heart, we share his name, his nature, his character. We understand that he's the head and we're the body, but it's all one perfect man whose name is the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, it's not him leading us, it's not him dragging us, so to speak, but instead it's him behind us, telling us the way to walk in. It's not us following in Jesus' footsteps, it's Jesus making his footsteps in our feet. So, turn to Galatians chapter 5, and this is where I want to close tonight. Galatians chapter 5, I'll read verses 13 through 18. And in the King James, it reads like this. Galatians 5, 13 says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. See, true liberty, true freedom is not to live however you want to live, it, however you know we thought we wanted to live when, when we were in Adam. True liberty is not, quote-unquote, license to sin. True liberty is the ability to love one another and serve one another. True liberty is to know who I am and to be who I am. And it's not the flesh, it's the spirit. He says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, ready? Galatians 5.16 This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And again, when we're talking about flesh, I, I, I th maybe I'm wrong about this, but I always thought, you know, my idea of the flesh was always, quote-unquote, bad stuff or, or dirty stuff or, or you know, fleshly and, and that sort of thing. But, but again, flesh is human effort. So he's saying, when you're walking in the Spirit, when you're, when you're in a posture of rest, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You won't get caught up in trying to do it yourself. <laughs> he says, if you're walking in the Spirit, if God is walking in you, if he's, again, if the teacher is standing behind you telling you, this is the way, walk ye in it, if you're led by the Spirit, then you won't, be, you won't be enticed to do things yourself. You won't try to make it happen on your own. You'll be able to just simply enjoy the life that God is living in and through you. Instead of trying to, trying to make something happen, you can just enjoy what already happened. And that's what God wants for His people. He did the work, so we don't have to make anything happen. We don't have to finish the work because it is finished. And if we would chop, stop trying, you know, again, through, through our foolish human effort to save ourselves, then we would understand that God took care of it. If we would stop being on such a big sin hunt, we would understand that, that Jesus is the Lamb of God and He took away the sin of the world. He took away the unbelief of the world by showing us the truth about the Father. And that's what I'm going to get into really next week when you know Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Next week we'll do the truth. But this is what He says, Walk in the Spirit 
and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Which again, he's not saying walk in the spirit or else, you know, he's not saying stay out of the flesh or else. He's saying nobody wants to be in the flesh. Here's how you avoid that. You walk in the spirit. You do, you live your life from a posture of rest where, where if God requires something from me, I know that he's going to do it in me and through me. It all comes from him. He says in verse 17, For the flesh lusteth again against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. So again, you know, even if you think, I want to serve God, but you're trying to do it in the flesh, it's not going to work. Human effort cannot get this abundant life done. It's impossible. God only accepted one sacrifice, you know, even all the way back to Cain and Abel. Cain brought the fruit of his labor, the fruit of the ground, the fruit of what he could produce through his effort, and God didn't want that. And Abel brought a lamb, and that's what God wanted. Because again, it spoke of Jesus, the perfect, spotless, sinless lamb of God. So it says, if you're, if, if, if you're trying to, even if you're trying to do the spirit through the flesh, you can't do it. He says in verse 18, but... If ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. So again, even if you're trying to do the Ten Commandments and you're trying really hard to, to follow those rules, you can't do it. But if you walk in the Spirit, then you won't have to worry about that. Then again it says, ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you're just simply saying, listen, I don't need a bunch of, uh, I don't need a bunch of laws to keep me in line because I have a life that keeps me right where I need to be. If I'm not trying to walk out this path that I think is the right path, but really the end of it is death. If instead I just know that this path it, it really is walking itself in me. If I can walk in the spirit instead of trying to walk out through the flesh. Then I can know that I'm right where I need to be. And again, it doesn't matter where you are on that road. Because again, you know, it's not for the unrighteous. It's not for the unclean. It, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's your relationship or, or your mode or your means, again, as Jesus said when, when he used that word way, it, it's how we get to the Father. And, and that's a lifelong relationship rather than a, a, a goal to meet, so to speak. So in the Message Bible, I'll read it in the Message Bible and then I'll close. Galatians 5, starting with verse 13 says, It is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence. Love others as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. If you bite and ravage each other, watch out. In no time at all, you will be annihilating each other. And where will your precious freedom be then? My counsel is this. Live freely. Animated and motivated by God's Spirit. Which again, is that principle that is the power of God working in us to will and to do. We are animated, moving, and motivated, wanting to move by God's Spirit. It all comes from the inside. He says, then you won't feed the compulsions of selfishness. For there is a root of sinful self-interest in us that is at odds with the free spirit. Just as the free spirit is incompatible with selfishness. These two ways of life are antithetical. So that you cannot live at times one way and at times another way according to how you feel on any given day. Again, the two ways, the two trees. There's a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And there's the way, the truth, and the life that gets us to the Father. So, so again, you know, it's not, well, I'm on, I'm on the highway of holiness, and now I'm not. I had a bad day, so I'm out of the will of God. It's, it's, that's not it at all. It's just simply when we're planted on the rock, then it's not about what we do. It's about who He is and what He did. So it says, why don't you choose to be led by the Spirit and so escape the erratic compulsions of a law-dominated existence? That's the problem with the law. The law demands perfection, but it can't produce perfection. The law points out your flaws, but it doesn't help you fix those flaws. And then Jesus comes along and he says, guess what? You don't have any flaws. 
He says, guess what? Because you're in me and I'm in you, you're spotless because I'm spotless. He says, I've presented you to myself as a bride without spot, wrinkle, or any such thing. He says, everything that needed to be done to get you to where you need to be happened on the cross. Now you are who you need to be. Now you are where you need to be. And now you can do what you are here to do. And again, what are we here to do? We're here to be loved and to love one another with that same love. To be loved by the Father and to share that love with, with the rest of His body. So, so again, how do we do that? It's not by trying to get on the road and trying to stay on the road. It's by understanding that Jesus is the way and He lives in us. It's not about walking it out in our human effort. It's about walking in the Spirit by understanding that the Spirit is walking in us. So that's what I have for this week. Uh, again, next week we'll move on to the truth. And we'll see that, that really that Jesus took away the sin of the world by displaying the truth about God. Amen.